Ramon steekt een mooie bal terug. Of, hier gaat Sting, hè? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Darshini David. Um, so what's actually happening here? Good morning. It's wonderful to see such a full house. It means that not only did many of you survive an early morning run with Lord Coe, but you also resisted the temptations of the rare sunshine outside and, of course, all those election campaigns which are kicking off this morning. Uh, my name's Darshini David. I'm an economist and I'm a broadcaster as well. And it's my immense pleasure to welcome you this morning to the launch of a truly groundbreaking study from Vitality and the independent researchers Rand Europe that tackles one of the biggest long-term challenges and conundrums facing us today. And it's really easy to forget, actually, when you look at sort of the near-term hurdles, issues, whatever you want to call them, be it the fog of Brexit uncertainty or global trade tensions, or even who's going to win strictly, to think about what actually really affects our prosperity for years to come. Because beyond all those sort of near-term distractions lies the greatest ticking bomb, time bomb perhaps, that we face uh, of our generation. And that is because productivity, particularly in the Western world, appears to have lost its mojo. Uh, because of our lack in efficiency gains since the financial crisis. Official estimates say that it's cost the average UK worker £5,000. Not something to take lightly. And also, we're all living longer, uh, but we're living less healthy lives as well. Just take obesity alone. And again, if you look at official stats, it's reckoned that that is going to cost us nearly £60 billion in total per year by 2050. So not just putting a strain on hearts and lives, but on the public purse and business as well. And of course, we're told there's no silver bullet when it comes to all of this, but actually just getting off the sofa could help. Sometimes the simplest things are the best, it seems, because by drawing on Vitality's international database, Rand Europe reckons the global economy could be boosted by around about $100 billion per day, till per year, sorry, per year, till 2050. Per day would be something really phenomenal. Um, by 2050, or £80 billion, pounds, if you prefer it, uh, in our currency, simply if we just walked an extra 15 minutes per day. So if you were to get up and just spend the rest of the session walking around the block, you'd have done your bit for the week. But don't do that. Please do stay here because we've got lots in store. And that again is just for starters, because if you actually follow the WHO recommendations on moderate aerobic activity, so I don't mean basically joining the training programme for that near successful England rugby team, uh, but if you just did 20 minutes of kind of moderate activity every day, uh, you could see a dividend of closer to £200 billion, pounds, or dollars rather, uh, across the year, across the world. And we're not just talking about, uh, you know, the globe as a whole. If you take it back to an individual country basis, the activity dividends, I like to think of it, here in the UK could be around £8 billion. Pounds. 
In the US, it could be around 70 billion pounds. And that's before we start talking about healthcare savings as well. And this all means longer, better lives too. So it's a win-win all round. Why do I talk about this being a groundbreaking study? Well, many have talked about the benefits, the health benefits of being more active, of course. But this is the first study that actually puts a price on all of this. It actually evaluates the economic benefits of increased physical activity on a global scale. And there's individual results for over 20 major economies as well. So let's get moving. We're going to be hearing from Adrian Gore, who is the founder and chief executive of Discovery and the force of nature, of course, behind the Global Vitality Network, about how the study actually came to be in the first place. Hans Pung, the president of Rand Europe, will uh, tell us on how he drew on those resources to actually evaluate the link between physical activity and economic well-being, what I like to think of as being a peer inside the black box. And our expert panel will consider how the benefits to society and business will fall. That, of course, is if, and it's a big if, we can actually put all of these findings into action. After all, how do you incentivise people in the age of internet shopping, the internet of things, and even the endless box sets to find the time to get active? Stand by for Lord Coe and Adrian Gore again, because they're going to be firing the starting gun with a very special global announcement. All of this too, of course, promises uh, gains to the public purse as well as business. So first of all, let's uh, give a very warm welcome to a man who's going to be swapping his desk for pounding the pavements over the next five weeks or so as he looks to regain or rather keep his seat in Spellthorn. He is the Minister of State for Business, Energy and Clean Growth. He is Kwasi Karteng and he's going to kick us off with a policymaker's response. Kwasi. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's obviously uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for everybody. Uh, for coming, and um, you're quite right. I, I'm going to be pounding the streets of my constituency the next five weeks, and this is my fourth general election. Uh, actually, it's my fifth general election, and one thing that happens in general elections is that candidates generally lose weight. You lose about three or four pounds during the, the campaign because you're walking and, and very active. And this actually uh, goes to the point of what we're trying to do. I texted Craig just about a quarter of an hour ago and said I was, I was five minutes away. And he, he texted back say, is that a real five minutes? And I said, yes, I'm on foot. And he said, how very appropriate. And actually, the reason I was on foot, I'm afraid, was that the underground had broken down, or the, the bit I, I usually use. But that was a very warm, uh, a warm welcome uh, for, from him. Um, I'll just say a few words about what I do and why I think the study is really, really important. Um, I am the energy minister. I still am. I'm not an MP technically today, but I'm still a minister. And I was appointed on the 24th of July, and I was the last appointment of the day. Um, I was uh, rung up at about uh, quarter to 11, and the Downing Street switchboard said that the Prime Minister would be with me very shortly. And very shortly actually turned out to be about 35 minutes. So I was on the phone, and every five minutes or so there was a bleep. And then at the end of that 35 minutes, uh, the Prime Minister just simply said, energy! And I said, that's a really, really good thing. We need more energy. We need to be more focused. And he said, no, I want you to be energy minister. And I was delighted with the brief. And actually, one of the things that I found uh, in the brief, and certainly in the Bayes department, is that we talk endlessly about productivity. We're endlessly concerned about how we boost uh, productivity. And I think studies like the one that uh, is being displayed, that's being announced, launched today, are absolutely vital. And before I was uh, energy minister, a long time before, about a year ago, I was uh, PPS to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Philip Hammond. And uh, he was a great chancellor. I, worked with, I enjoyed working with him very much. And one of the things, again, that we talked about all the time, I was there for 18 months, and I'm sure we talked about productivity every single day. That was one thing that we were completely focused on. And actually, what I find so refreshing about this approach, about this study, is that it's taking a, a much more holistic view of the productivity challenge. And it's linking it into well-being, into lifestyle, and into a whole uh, way of life. And I think that's something that we in government uh, would be really interested in, are really interested in. And I look forward uh, to be able to realize and have a dialogue uh, with some of you about the findings in this, in this study, because 
as uh, we all know, it's all about implementation. It's all about policy and actually trying to move, uh, move things forward. I think the, uh, the background is fantastic. Um, I think this is really just the start of what will be an extremely uh, helpful dialogue, not only between government and um, think tanks, but also businesses as well. I think lots of people can get behind uh, the work that you're doing pioneering today. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great conference. I've got to nip up to Birmingham. Whoops, that's where our campaign is being launched. <laughs> I'm not supposed to have said that, but you will f all will be revealed uh, shortly. But thank you very much. Minister, thank you. We are trusting that you are going to be walking to Birmingham to get us a head start on that pledge. <laughs> um, but uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, invite the man who actually started the uh, starting gun on this particular study, Adrian Gore, to the stage to take us through some of the findings. Adrian. Today, vitality touches the lives of over 16 million people in 23 markets across the globe. We are guided by our core purpose of making people healthier and enhancing and protecting their lives. Vitality is really a remarkable idea that is actually just a personification of shared value. The more we looked at it, the more we realized that Vitality was doing something progressive by taking a long-term view of health. In 2018, Vitality, together with Apple and Rand Europe, conducted the largest ever behavior change study on physical activity. It showed that combining Vitality Active Rewards incentives with the Apple Watch benefit leads to significant and sustained increases in activity levels. So this year I've walked about 3.6 million steps, and uh, if I hustle a little bit, I think I can make 4 million. My health has increased, you know, I'm fitter. I've done things now I would have never done. I mean, last year I ran a marathon. This year, I climbed Kilimanjaro. It has made me more competitive. And my friend and I are joined together to run London Marathon next year. Together with our network of insurance partners across the globe, we're committed to making 100 million people 20% more active by 2025. We know that 28% of the world's population are inactive, leading to 5 million deaths every year. Today, we look forward to sharing a new study with you. So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. It's great being a South African in London at the moment, I have to say. <laughs> Whenever I go, people congratulate me for the Rugby World Cup. Uh, at five foot eight, there's kind of no evidence of my impact, I have to say, on the result. But um, it really is wonderful to be here. Um, it's, it's my role to kind of contextualize the, uh, the study. Hans from Rand will, I think, tell us more about the technical issues of, of the study. I thought maybe just to make some comments about kind of how we got here, why we did what we're doing, uh, and give you context of, of kind of the study. Just a few comments, you know, the roots of vitality and discovery, and a lot of my team are here that, that, that build the organization, were around uh, initially a few decades ago, how to build a health insurance company in South Africa, in a, in a country emerging from apartheid into democracy. And the uh, complexity could not be overstated. Too few doctors, terrible levels of disease burden, uh, an egal egalitarian regulatory system imposed onto the country, rightly so, given the uh, kind of discrimination of the past. And our kind of hunch, without much science or any real data, was a simple idea of build a company that would make people healthier, bring the demand for healthcare down, and the way to do that is to incentivize people to be healthy. And that was without much, I think, insight into you know, what was going on, the science, etc. What happened, though, um, has been a number of things. I think the emerging data about just a few behaviors make all the difference. So this kind of this, uh, 4 4 60 idea that Four behaviours, smoking, eating badly, uh, drinking, and certainly physical inactivity, the, the subject of today, drive four conditions that drive 60% of mortality and 80% or more of the disease burden. And I think understanding that as that data came about gave us a considerable amount of inspiration to kind of push on. The other point to make is, is, is three trends that you can see that kind of come together over the last number of years, over the last 32 decades, around tech, the power of technology, obviously, the nature of risk, 
understanding from behavioral economics that people, even though this 4 for 60 is so clear, so powerful, people make the wrong choices because of behavioral bias and understanding how to overcome that. And then, of course, something over the last number of years, since 2008, the importance of purpose. These three trends have come together to create a kind of an imperative that we can transform uh, insurance markets. And so what was a very local South African idea two decades ago has globalized, I think, very, very quickly and very successfully. Um, and our model really works, I think, very simply. This idea of taking vitality as behavioral chassis that incentivizes behavior change and underpinning financial services and insurance and linking the two together in a way that is kind of integrated, works and makes it intuitive and simple for, for, for the customer. And I think what we've tried to get to is a very, as you heard earlier, a very simple shared value model. No trade-offs at all. Good for society. We incentivize people to change their behavior. By changing behavior, they become healthier. We're more profitable. We can use the profit to fund the incentives, and you get this virtual, uh, this virtuous shared value cycle. No downside at all. Good for us, good for our customers, and good for society. And so we've kind of been on this journey. I think what has been really important for us, and I think that really frames what we're trying to do, has been the vitality network of partners we work with. So over time, over the last number of years, we've worked with better companies and bigger companies in different parts uh, of the world in a very similar way, underpinning vitality to many parts of their, of their products. Um, and today, in fact, yesterday here in London, we had our Global Vitality Conference where all of our partners, and many are here in the room today, and we're very grateful that you're here, met to discuss you know, the way forward, new ideas, new products, and how we're going to take this model going forward. So we really have a considerable base uh, of, of partners of scale, I think, to influence the world in a very positive way. You can see that it's amazing, the Vitality Network, the companies that make them up, really cover 35% of the world's covered population. So the ability to affect change, to impact the world, I think is real and very powerful. And so we're on this journey of, of trying to make people healthier, and I think it's remarkably exciting. The issue of physical activity is pretty central to this. There's, of course, a number of behaviors in, in, in trying to get people healthy and to live longer and better lives, but physical activity is so powerful. And if you look at the emerging data coming out of our experience, it is com incredibly compelling. The fact is that physical inactivity is correlated to premature mortality. You can see on the left-hand side of the chart that people that are physically active and there's a dose effect, the more they do within reason, the better. But you can see the drop in levels of mortality. And then critically on the right-hand side of the chart, physical activity is a trigger event. So we found from our data, when people become physically active, they start doing other things, preventive screening, eating better, smoking less, etc. So physical activity really is something you know we can change. Its effect is dramatic, and it's a trigger event uh, to wellness generally. And so for us, that has been a very central part of trying to get our program to work with our partners uh, and in the kind of vitality chassis around incentivizing change and driving people to be healthier by being more physically active. There's a number of things that we've done um, over the years. I think one of the more successful things that we've done has been the idea of active rewards. We've called it active rewards. It's really kind of gamifying physical activity. The idea that every week you have a goal, you meet your physical goal through steps or walking or exercising, and you get a very simple kind of reward, a Starbucks coffee, it's created a sea change in our data about people getting physically active and becoming part of this process. A number of years ago, we began, we began working with Apple around the idea of active rewards with Apple Watch. And the concept of the watch kind of being the device that you use to track your physical activity. But I think a very important learning from us, we use the watch as a reward as well, kind of a loss frame reward. The idea is a very simple one. You get the watch kind of for free or almost for free. You pay for it monthly over a two-year period. But the level of the repayment flexes based on your physical activity, you see. So if you're physically active, you don't pay for the watch. And I think the power of that understanding kind of behavioral economics loss aversion is you've got something to lose. And so this loss frame benefit had a, an amazing effect. Now, data showed very conclusively how active people became. Uh, and so last year with RAND, we did a study that you may have seen around actually illustrating the effect of this benefit on levels of physical act uh, activity and its sustainability uh, as we went forward. And we showed there, I'm not going to go into the detail here, that we managed to increase physical activity by 34%. And amazingly, across different health statuses, across South Africa, the UK, the US, so the data was, I think, very, very compelling. And on the back of that, we started to think uh, more globally about not just our own markets, but could we actually make a dent on this problem globally? 
And so a year ago, we launched this very ambitious pledge. We would, as the Vitality Network, in a sense, and you saw that earlier video, we would collectively make 100 million people more physically active by 20% by 2025. And that was the pledge. So we've taken this, I think, remarkably seriously. We're working incredibly hard with our partners to make sure we do achieve uh, this, this pledge. And as part of this, we felt very strongly we need to kind of change the narrative about physical activity. We need to take our data, broader data, and actually create the narrative about what the impact could be, not just on health, but on economic activity. And so the study you will see, and, and Hans from Rand will tell us more about that a bit later, about the technicalities, is actually, I think, a very, very different study. It's comprehensive. It looks at the effect of physical activity on mortality, on productivity, but critically, it looks at the effect ultimately on economic activity, economic growth, and I think that's, that is very, very important. A few points. Um, I think the study is kind of sequential. It looks at the impact of, of, uh, of physical activity on mortality and lowering mortality. It uses a, a meta-study, a meta-approach to, to a bunch of many, many studies that I think you'll hear about later. It then uses our data from seven markets about the relationship between physical activity and productivity. So people live longer, they're more productive, and then through an economic model, the two together creates economic impact and economic growth. That's really the methodology of how the study uh, was, was done. Well, I found quite um, really interesting, and I think quite inspiring, um, I mean, it's sad on one hand, but I think we can affect change, is just how physically inactive the world really is. So, you know, something I think we have to change, we have Fiona Bull from the WHO here, but we, we have to change the narrative around this idea that to be physically active, you've got to go to gym and you've got to do all kinds of things. The reality is the world is incredibly inactive. So, you know, I think the WHO uh, guidelines work in, uh, um, in what they call METs, metabolic equivalents, and effectively we should be doing 600 METs a week of exercise. That amounts to about 20 minutes a day of walking in total. I mean, it's a fairly undemanding requirement, you would think, right? But when you look at the, the data, 50% um, of the world do less than an hour of basically walking a day, brisk walking a day. And I think when you get to the WHO requirements, nearly a third of the world does less than 20 minutes of walking a day. It's remarkable. So when you look at this, you kind of realize we're not dealing with getting people into the gyms and running marathons and all these complicated things. We just need to motivate people to walk around a bit, and if we can achieve that, we can make dramatic impact. And to an extent, there's a lot of data in the study, but certainly from a, a vitality perspective, we'd like to change the narrative to kind of doing simple things in a very simple way and making an impact uh, on the world. So when you see the level of inactivity, I think it kind of points to the, the real problem, but I think to the, to the opportunity. The study looks at uh, a number of countries, I think 23 countries, and it looks at it globally as well. But just a few points to make is that the developed world is kind of double as bad as the developing world. I think people are more sedentary. I think it's just the nature of activities of daily living. And then you'll see that adolescents are really a problem, over 80% are of, of physically inactive. And that is a real, real issue. So when you go through the study, I think that is something really to watch. We considered three scenarios um, in the study. Uh, scenario one is just taking people that are below that WHO threshold and assuming what would happen to mortality, to productivity, to economic growth, if we made them get to the level of the WHO, the 600 meters, or get them to walk equivalently 20 minutes a day. Again, not a demanding scenario. Scenario two is taking everyone and assuming the entire world increases physical activity by 20%. And then scenario three is kind of the addition of the two. Get people physically inactive to the right guidelines, the minimum guidelines, uh, and get the balance up 20% and trying to understand the impact on, 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 uh, on economic growth, uh, ec the economic impact of, of those scenarios. Um, I think the results are very compelling. Um, if you look at them, scenario one, two, and three illustrates the actual combined economic impact of getting people more physically active. Scenario one is simply taking the inactive and getting them to effective level of 20 minutes of walking a day. Now bear in mind, that's not an additional 20 minutes. That's if you're doing 15, it's an additional 5, you follow? If you're doing naught, it's taking you to 20. So this is not a very demanding uh, requirement, but if we achieve it, the kind of present value of growth per annum, the present value of economic impact per annum, is about $220 billion. On the other extreme, uh, if we do both, we get people who are inactive to the minimum requirements and all the others up 20%, the effect is about $364 billion uh, per, per annum. So the, the economic effect is quite, quite remarkable. 
I think we were inspired by scenario one. Could we make the, the physically inactive people active? Um, as I've tried to stress to you, that all we're talking about, combined over the day, is kind of a, a reasonable, moderate walk for 20 minutes of the day. I don't know how to kind of bring this to life, but the thought we had is, really, if you're sitting in this hotel, is walking to the Apple store and coming back. That's it. You don't have to buy anything in the store, actually. I have to just stress. <laughs> but going to the store and coming back, and you've done it. And this is the combined requirement um, over, over, over the day. It would seem that that's something, surely, we could affect. If you look at that, I made the point that at the, at the kind of global economic level, the effect is $220 billion per annum. But if you look at the personal effect, it is profound. It adds a, a further two and a half years of life to the average 40-year-old. I think it's quite remarkable. And adds five days of productivity. So the effect at, a, at an economic level is substantial. The effect, I think, at a personal level is profound. And I think that's the opportunity. So we, we really are trying to affect very small change with the impact, I think, being substantial. I don't know how you kind of emote two and a half years of extra life. You know, it means different things to different people. We've tried a few different ways here. You know, if you missed two and a half years in the 60s, you will have missed the four great albums of the Beatles and, uh, and the lunar landing. Um, that movie yesterday kind of came to mind after I saw this, this thing. You would never heard the Beatles if you missed those two and a half years. You'd live longer as a grandparent and spend more time with your grandchildren. You get a college degree you might not have had. So I don't know how, how we get this across, but we really need to create a narrative that losing two and a half years for a simple, easy-to-do activity is something we have to try and kind of get out there. I think that's critical. So let me end by just making a few very simple points. Uh, sitting with the study show to us is that the financial gains are significant to the economy through productivity and people living longer, so more people that are active. Uh, the personal impact is profound. But the critical thing is that we know from our data we can affect change, and the change we are after is actually very, very small. So we kind of don't want to leave the study just hanging out there as just another study. We need action. Uh, the action we're taking is our pledge. You'll hear a bit later about our next step in trying to push that forward. But we really would like to kind of make a plea for action in some way, just to get physically inactive people somewhat active. And if we can do that, I think the effect would be profound. So enough from me. I hope you find the study interesting. Uh, we are busy, hard at work, continuing on our journey, um, and a lot to do. I've said enough. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Adrian, for the moment, uh, thank you very much indeed. So as we were hearing there, we just have South Africa gets the credit for winning the Rugby World Cup, but also for providing the kernel behind this idea. But of course, it's flourished since then. We now have the results of the study and the man who has overseen that journey, and no small task by any means when you're doing something that's never been done before, is of course Hans Perm, the president of RAND Europe. He and his researchers, eight months was it in Cambridge that they took uh, along the way, he's going to take us through that journey and take us through exactly what the study found and how. He's the one who's going to make a compelling case for exactly why this is groundbreaking for the whole of society, a win-win. No pressure, Hans, but over to you. Thank you. Great. So thank you very much, Darshini. I mean, the irony of coming and talking about a study about the benefits of physical activity when walking up with a crutch was not lost on me. I think the lesson is do not play basketball on a Monday night with a bunch of 20-year-olds who run it up and down the court when I you know, am not anywhere near 20. But there we go. Um, thank you, Adrian, for your remarks as well. I think I'm really delighted to be here today to launch Rand's latest research looking at the cost of physical inactivity, or maybe to frame it more positively, the economic benefits of physical activity more broadly. Um, my name is Hans Pung. I'm the president of RAND Europe. And I'll just briefly share some of my own perspectives regarding the study and what it did. Now, before I get into that, I mean, the relationship between activity, health, and mortality is actually very well established. I mean, when you look at data from the World Health Organization, and I'm sure Fiona will be able to talk about this when she's on the panel later, you know, insufficient physical activity is recognized as one of the leading risk factors for death. 
Well, from a health perspective, research is very, very clear that activities associated with a lower risk of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, diabetes, and is further associated with positive effects on mental health. And of course, these are really important outcomes, particularly for individuals, and Adrian talked very clearly about that. Um, but they don't really provide insights into how physical activity affects our economy more broadly. You know, for example, the productivity of employees or how these effects may combine nationally or globally on the economy. So given this context, Rand was really pleased to have undertaken this comprehensive study that evaluates the economic benefits of making people more physically active. Effectively, what we did was simulate the real global economy. Our approach allows for a very detailed assessment of the current and future implications of insufficient physical activity on the economy beyond just the traditional considerations of health care and mortality, what I talked about earlier. Indeed, the research that we did points to various significant relationship between inactivity and productivity loss, driven largely by ill health related presenteeism, um, which largely hasn't been accounted for in studies of this sort, which have happened before. And when you look at those studies, previous studies that assess the economic burden of insufficient physical activity, almost all of them are done on a national level. Um, they're not done on a global level, and the studies apply very, very different modeling methodologies and different approaches to the nature and type of costs that are included in the analysis. And this actually makes a comprehensive overview of what this means globally very difficult, because effectively you're comparing apples to oranges to pears to tomatoes. Um, and it's very, very difficult to do. So what Rand attempted to do in this study, and I think very well succeeded, makes a comparison of the economic burdens of physical activity across countries. Um, and we've sought to address these limitations from, pre excuse me, from previous work by using a dynamic multi-country multi, uh, macroeconomic model that comprehensively assesses the impact of physical activity on national economies on a consistent basis. So you can do this comparison, allowing for an aggregation to the global economy. And in addition to this, the study contributes to the existing literature, i.e. what we know on physical activity, in three really important ways. Um, the first thing it does is takes a very novel approach, effectively a meta-analysis of the existing evidence on physical activity and mortality risk by really looking at the study design and some of the publication bias of those previous studies into account. And it gives us a much more accurate view of the relationship between activity and mortality than has been in the, ca the case in previous studies. The second thing that the study does is utilizes Vitality's extensive proprietary data set on workplace health, um, derived from the Healthiest Workplace Initiative in seven different countries that assesses the relationship between physical activity on one hand and productivity at work and performance at work. And this is really where the existing evidence base is the weakest and where the study makes the greatest contribution to what we know. Um, the current study significantly advances our understanding of the relationship between activity, absence from work, and presenteeism, and therefore the effect of inactivity on the broader economy. And then thirdly, what the study does is effectively combines then what we now know better about mortality and productivity effects into a single model to project the true economic cost of physical activity over time or with a number of scenarios that Adrian went through very well that demonstrate how those costs and benefits could change if the populations were to become more active in a variety of ways. This was effectively scenarios one, two, and three that Adrian talks about. And when you look at the costs and the challenge of physical activity, you know, it is immense. Our study points to a global economic cost of potentially $364 billion per annum on average for the next 30 years, arising from premature death and reduced productivity. But our research also points to significant economic gains that could be achieved through moderate but eminently achievable lifestyle changes. So for example, as Adrian mentioned, you know, if everyone could incorporate an additional 15 minutes of walking into their day, the global economy would receive an annual GDP boost of approximately 100 billion pounds. 
So we at RAND Europe are very, very excited about the potential that this study brings and the application that it has not only for policymakers, the minister, um, employers, but, and, but also a broader spectrum of stakeholders, including Vitality and your insurance network. Um, I'd like to thank my team, particularly Marco Hefner, who was the lead analyst on the study, for their commitment and excellent work on the project. And I look forward to discussing the findings of the study uh, with anyone who's interested at the conclusion of this event. So thank you very much. And thank you so much. And uh, please do take hands off on his kind offer to discuss the study in more detail because it is very fascinating when you start delving into the detail. Uh, the big question, as he's saying there, is this talks about the potential we can have, but how do we go about realising the economic gains? For that, we turn to the man known as the undercover economist. He is, of course, the broadcaster, Financial Times columnist and author, Tim Harford. Uh, joining him for a panel discussion now will be Professor Fiona Bull. She's WHO programme manager. Manager, Stuart Spencer, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of AIA, Mark Tucker, who is HSBC's Group Chairman, and Brooks Tingle, the CEO of John Hancock. So without any further ado, Tim, do come on up. Thank you very much, Darshini. Um, while, while my esteemed panelists take their place, there we go, Brooks. No, no need to apologise. No, I actually, I had, I had no idea that walking was so good for you. I, I, I should say, I was um, on my honeymoon. My wife and I walked uh, across England from the from the west to the east. It's about two hundred and twenty miles, about three hundred kilometres. I'm just wondering whether this GDP boost can we save <laughs> that up? Is that sort of, yeah. I mean, after. After you've done that, there's not much, uh, not much other physical activity you get to do on your honeymoon. But it was a great walk. <laughs> now, as well as being an economist, I love, um, I love logic puzzles uh, and lateral thinking puzzles. And I was listening to one recently that I, that I found very in intriguing. So the, the puzzle goes like this. Jack and Jill each buy uh, a product. And three months later, Jill has received absolutely nothing. Because Jack has received an enormous benefit, but there's no way that Jill would want to swap places with Jack. In fact, she's perfectly happy. What was the product? And I, I heard this, uh, heard somebody struggling to deal with this lateral thinking puzzle. Of course, everybody here knows what the product is. It's insurance, right? Jack got an insurance payout because something terrible happened to him. Mm. Jill didn't, and she, she likes it that way. And the fact that this puzzle was so puzzling to somebody outside the insurance industry, I think points to this um, intriguing paradox, um, which is that you know, I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to get sick. I, I don't want to suffer from depression. I don't want to get cancer. I don't want to have a heart attack. Um, neither does my insurance company want me to have any of these things. Uh, neither, as, as the RAND study showed, does the government want this to happen. Neither does my employer want this to happen. Nobody wants this to happen. And yet, how is it that we work together to try to prevent it happening? And that, that's one of the things that I'll be discussing uh, with, with the panel today. Because as far as the insurance industry is concerned, of course, there is this uh, model now called shared value insurance, this model whereby the insurer uh, helps people to avoid running into trouble, helps people to avoid running into <coughs> ill health, and generates value for both of them. So I wanted to, to um, start, but feel free uh, for any panelists to jump in, but I wanted to start by, by asking Mark. Um, this idea uh, of insurers uh, trying to change the behavior of the people they insure, I mean, it sounds very sparkly and new. Is it, is it actually an old idea, like, like many things? I think the, the fact that insurers, I think, have been focused on customer beha behavior has been something that has happened for, for a very long time. Uh, I think what has not been there, and it's been a much more static approach, is that they've, uh, that they've focused not on changing customer behavior. And I think that, that is a significant difference. And I think smoking is a, uh, is a great example of that, where smoking was a, an underwriting criteria, but there was no 
you, you were either graded one way or another, but there was no incentive either way for you to, other than the insurance premium itself, to, to do that. And I think the, the nature of what has happened is that we are now seeing, really for the first time, the changing of that behaviour. And I think that is the most uh, products and the industry looking at behavioural uh, economics, looking at behavioural trends and using that in an active and productive way. Yeah, it's interesting to, to think of smoking as just being something that just gets assigned. You're a smoker or you're not a smoker, and there's nothing anybody can do about mm. it. So just <coughs> price the risk accordingly. Absolutely. But actually, what, what we heard earlier is that some of the behaviour change we're looking at is not, it's not very major. Um, so uh, I'm going to come to Professor Bull in a moment. I want to talk to, the, to these, uh, our, our insurance men here. So, uh, so <laughs> Stuart. That's the most flattering label. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> insurance it's, it is the deep, that too. It's the, it, it men with the profoundest of respect. Mm. Although I have to say that um, Professor Bull is a real doctor. She, had, she did emphasize from a proper doctor, uh, not just a professor, uh, actually a doctor who can make people better. Um, so, Stuart, I, I, I wanted to, to ask about AIA's uh, mm -hmm. experience. There's this, um, I think, perception that it, there's been a big change in introducing the shared value model. So could you talk me through why AIA made that decision and, and what the challenges and the opportunities sure. have been? Sure. Thanks, Tim. It's, it's critical that I, I acknowledge the, the contributions from Mark, who was the visionary leader that really propelled us on our way forward in our journey um, of transformation. Let me give you the AIA and the Asia perspective. AIA is the largest pan-Asian life and health insurer. We're celebrating our 100th birthday this year, 100 years young. We have 33 million customers across the region from New Zealand to Korea uh, to the Indian subcontinent. The landscape across Asia is frightening. We are witnessing today an unprecedented epidemic in lifestyle disease. I would be happy with 4460. But we're dealing in an Asian environment of 4490 and beyond. This is obviously of great concern. So as the leading life and health insurer, we have a choice. We can stand on the sidelines and we can hope that our morbidity and mortality curves ultimately bend um, in the right direction. We could adhere to the traditional business model of life insurance of you die and, and we pay. Or we take a stand. Or we initiate an effort to conduct the largest behavioral change operation in our industry in Asia in history. And that's exactly what we have done. The antidote, the pixie dust that we possess as insurers is fundamentally vitality. Vitality makes everyone and everything better. And so in embracing vitality over the last five years, we have a brand promise of healthier, longer, better lives. That is what we stand for, that is our purpose, that is our reason for existence. But it's not enough just to say that's what we do. We must fundamentally be able to enable our customers to really achieve that healthier, longer, better life. And there is no better proof point for us at AIA um, than AIA Vitality. And the dividends um, in the last five years have been remarkable. The biometric clinical improvements of our customers across BMI, LDL, HbA1c, blood pressure have been remarkable across multiple cohorts tested over the last five years. Our customers who are Vitality customers stay longer, buy more, buy more frequently. Our tight agents who sell our Vitality products sell more, sell more frequently, are more active. Vitality just makes everything better. And so for those in the industry who aren't on the program, they do so, quite frankly, at their own peril. Uh, have there been any obstacles to, to adopting this, this There approach? have been a few. We operate in 18 markets across Asia Pacific, regulatory, cultural, yeah. linguistic, um, the mythologies that we operate in across, across the region, different stages of development. The concept of SVI is, is so innovative so novel in a part of the world where the insurance industry for so long has been somewhat staid, antiquated, <coughs> lethargic. This is injected energy. This is fundamentally changing the dialogue of insurance. Again, from, from death, fear, dying, consequences. Nobody wants to hear about that. <laughs> People want life. They want living. They want health. They want wellness. They want well-being. They want vitality. 
They want to see the glass as half full, not half empty. And so we believe AIA Vitality is the ultimate toolkit for our customers to lead a healthier, longer, better life. And Brooks, I know that John Hancock has been moving also to this shared value mm -hmm. model. And, and a lot of your products, maybe all your products, are linked to behavior. Uh, so ha have you had the same your amazing results as Stuart has? Is it we have just a quick note on the, the history of this type of insurance. Our, our company's 157 years old now, and a few years ago we put together a company museum. Yeah. And in the archives, we found in the 1930s a program where at the time, now most deaths are associated with lifestyle diseases, but at the time, more deaths were associated with communicable diseases. And John Hancock had a program where we'd send nurses around to our clients' homes to teach them proper hygiene and things to try to cut down on the number of uh, deaths due to communicable diseases. Unfortunately, the American Medical Association thought we were infringing on their territory and we shut it down. But, um, but the notion of engaging your clients to try to improve health outcomes isn't entirely new. Now, nothing at all is, is brilliant is what happens now with Vitality. Um, you know, we very much like, you know, our <coughs> colleagues at AIA woke up a few years ago and thought, um, it sure makes a lot of sense that we would care about our customers living a longer, healthier life. I say all the time, other than your immediate friends and family, who should care more about you living a long, healthy life than your life insurance company? And it struck us as just really profoundly odd that for hundreds of years our industry has issued policies on people, sat back and said, sure, hope you all live long, healthy lives, but we're not going to do one thing to try to affect that outcome. And we're probably best positioned. I'm, I'm biased, of course. I'm not only an insurance guy, I'm a life insurance guy. But um, you know, life insur insurers in particular and are, are in a wonderful position to influence outcomes with their customers. Our relationships with customers average 20 years. At Hancock, we paid a claim a couple years ago where the client had been a client for 99 years. Uh, parents bought the chapel policy on his first birthday. He died shortly after his 100th birthday. So what a, a wonderful position to be in, to work with somebody their entire life or their entire adult life. So given the shared alignment or the, the, the alignment around outcomes, given the long relationship, shouldn't we be engaging those clients? So anyways, that, that's why we kind this of... This would be, be the real stretch goal, right? I want all, all of my clients to be clients for 99 yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. So um, that would be a wonderful thing, yeah. Um, so when we hooked up with Vitality, it just made so much sense. And it, and it really has transformed our business. We started offering Vitality as an optional benefit uh, in 2015, saw such powerful results uh, from those that were electing it, that last fall, we said that we would no longer issue life insurance policies in the U.S. Uh, without vitality benefits and features on it. We've seen all the same effects. Uh, our customers more active, uh, customers seeing their, their doctor more frequently, all those types of things. One thing that I would say, just in terms of the transformation of our business model, we've gone from interacting with our customers once or twice a year in a very boring administrative way, send them a bill or send them a privacy notice. Now, I have old life insurance policies before Vitality where I pay automatically, uh, you know, electronic transfer or whatever. The one thing I get every year is a privacy notice. Yeah. Most, the, literally the one communication I have from my insurer. It's a big day in the Tingle household when the privacy notice is right. <laughs> We gather around and read them. But, but, now, um, but now with Vitality, you know, we are literally interacting with our customers upwards of 40 times a month, yeah. once or twice a year to 40 times a month in the most positive ways to shape these They, they presumably like this, otherwise they'd, they they'd do, click yeah. unsubscribe. Yeah, because right? the interactions are, hey, here's yeah. some points for taking steps, or here's a discount at the grocery store, or here's some nutritional uh, advice. Uh, not only do they like it, they love it, and we're, we have this much more dynamic engagement with, back to the commercials of it all, imagine our opportunity to serve those clients better, uh, offer them additional coverage, uh, other products, things like that. So, I mean, what, what have you found works best to, to induce behavior change? Has there been anything that you've just thought, I, I never would have expected that this would work, but... It's amazing what Hong Kongers will do for a cappuccino, yeah. <laughs> um, to be very honest. But we, we found that the richness of the rewards platform directly correlates to the inducement to drive behavioral change. The rewards have got to be great. Yeah. Otherwise, people just won't bother. Look, people know they need to take better care of themselves. But so it's, uh, there's, there's, it's there's, there's a cognizance though. gap between knowing I need to do it and, and getting that nudge, mm -hmm. get rewarded to do it. It's the rewards just, platform that drives Sorry, it. I just add richness, but, but the engaging nature of the rewards platform yeah. is, yeah. for those of you that don't know, there's this wonderful thing called the Vitality Wheel. Uh, for our program, every 10th workout you complete, your mobile device shakes and you spin this wheel. And, and the rewards are only you know, $10 at Starbucks or 15 yeah. at iTunes. 
But I get letters or emails from clients all the time now, many of whom are very wealthy people, that said, this Vitality wheel is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. And it, there are these small rewards, but it's very, very engaging. So it's um, a gamification, engaging, and, and, sure. and the value of the rewards here. Yeah. I was, I, so, so it's both then, really. It's that you know, they actually, people feel there's something of value being offered, but actually at the same time, it's, there's a game being played, and the game itself is fun. People are competitive. People like games. Yeah. 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 Let me ask Professor Ball. So the, the WHO is, is obviously trying to get people to be more active. Um, you, you're leading that program. So um, what, what have you found works? What are the obstacles? And, and how do you see the RAND study connecting to that? Well, thank you and good morning. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here from WHO at this event. Um, you say obviously, and I suppose I'll, I'll, um, I'll open that up in just a moment. <laughs> um, uh, given the history, we're probably the youngest 71-year-old organisation uh, celebrating 70 years last year with our new Director General um, with a very clear and revised mission, a three billion target. We want the world to be safer, to be protected and to be healthier. Uh, and yes, health is in our name, but health is in a lot of insurance and health systems, but they have historically really focused on disease. And treatment. So I'm very pleased to, to be here to reinforce and share the shift that we have, a shift that at WHO about achieving one billion people healthier. The other two billions are the protected and safer. And in that healthier, we need to look at not just treatment, but actually shift to the prevention. And that's why uh, this is such an important report, uh, because it is putting the spotlight on one of the four causes of the major causes of disease and, and, and death, premature death. Uh, and Adrian's slide showed those, so I won't repeat, but you know the four causes. And physical activity is part of the solutions here. This report offers a number of things, which were very nicely um, summarized in the brief introductions. Uh, reinforcing the evidence, and that's always important, uh, not just from health people, but it's uh, an absolute pleasure to start hearing some of those same sentences, statements coming from the voices and the influencers in this room and elsewhere. But it does something secondly which is very important and responds to a call that WHO has put out. It quantifies, and it's starting to quantify something not just in the health system, the prevention that can uh, uh, reduce healthcare costs, health services, et cetera, that you know very well, but actually the wider community benefits, society benefits, the macroeconomic analysis. That's um, quantifying something for us to start talking about and change the conversation. I don't think anyone in this room would challenge the, the risks you take if you smoke. It, I, I'd be surprised if there was challenging that. And yet physical activity is sitting there with sort of a recognition, as you just said, a sort of a broader acknowledgement. Of course we should all do something, but we don't. The data show we don't. And thank you for using the WHO data to show the profound problem around the world. Latin America, uh, high-income Asia, as well as high-income Europe, North America, are some of the most inactive regions. So this is not just the privileged uh, high-income earners individually or high-income countries. It's actually a worldwide because of the changes. So we're delighted to see this report, delighted it's quantifying it, and it will be a catalyst to action, which I think is where you're, you're, you're taking us with what do we do. Well, yeah, because I, I'm, clearly not everybody has health insurance. Not, yeah. not everyone has life insurance. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that was really striking looking at the... Um, the, the material that, that, that Adrian was, was presenting is so many people are doing nothing, absolutely nothing, mm. in terms of physical activity. It's, it's not like, well, you know, you, um, you walk and cycle, but you could be doing a marathon. They're doing mm. nothing. Mm. So how do, you, how do you reach those people, both who are perhaps economically uh, disadvantaged or hard to reach, and also just in terms of the, they're completely disconnected from their own physical activity, their own bodies, that, that confidence to, to get moving? Well, thank you, because the question is a profound one, and the answer is long, but I will keep perhaps just to a few key areas. There's not a single solution for such a problem, and the, the, the solutions will vary, and, and they are different in different parts of the world and countries. So what um, the reasons for an older, overweight woman would, might be different to, and are different, to, um, to younger men, uh, who most, they most, uh, they 
they, they may both be inactive. So the solutions lie in absolutely where Adrian introduced, changing the knowledge base and the conversation and the uh, value that we place on physical activity. I'll go back to my tobacco example. Um, we need to make physical activity and, uh, recognised. Number two, it's about environments. Uh, some places it's not safe. The air pollution, safety from the roads, cars, traffic injuries and accidents. Uh, we've got to improve road safety to encourage walking and cycling. Uh, the opportunities is the third area. More opportunities, more nudges, more programmes that encourage and incentivise and reach the people who are not the marathon runners. So we actually need to understand that market. Um, and sports people may or may not fully be the right um, uh, audience there. They need to actually understand what is preventing someone getting up. And there's some lovely examples I'd be happy to share with you about how governments, private sector uh, and the civil society are getting involved in that. And lastly, we need to catalyse. And that's why data, evidence, uh, economics. So we need this combination, and I thought very nicely summarised in the report, it's an ecosystem. Uh, but solutions lie in more opportunities, like the behaviour change programme of vitality, incentivising, getting people off the couch, trying a low level and a small amount, because that is where you start. And then you can build up to other things. Um, what appeals to others, what appeals in each of the markets we're hearing about will vary, but we are within reach of these solutions and we need to scale them. I want to come back to you if we have time. I hope we will have time to, to ask you to elaborate on one or two of those examples. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask Mark and, and actually anybody on the panel is, to contribute by, by all means. But um, one of the, the things that Adrian identified was um, the sense of, that people just expect more from business these days. Uh, my, my illustrious employer, the Financial Times, talks about moral money, mm -hmm. uh, the corporate social responsibility movement. People are rejecting the, the old Milton Friedman idea that the responsibility of business is to, is to look after its shareholders. I wanted to ask, do, do you think that something real is changing there? And if uh, companies are coming under pressure to, to raise their game and to recognise more st stakeholders, where is that coming from? from? From your own customers, from regulators, from... Uh -huh from journalists? Yeah, there, there, there's definitely a real change. This is not sort of uh, imagined or, or, or ephemeral. This is, uh, this is a significant shift. And, and I think there is a look at purpose and a purpose beyond uh, just delivering value to, to, to shareholders. Uh, and this has come about through sort of the environment, environmental issues, social issues, corporate governance uh, areas. And this is... The focus on this, I think, has become uh, there's clearly real science and there's real populism as well. Uh, and, and the combination is, a, is quite a powerful one and will be a, a force to be reckoned with. And I think this will then mean there's a logical extension into, uh, into governments, into regulators, and ultimately into uh, uh, man mandation. You'll be mandatory requirements for... Uh, for all of these over time, unless this, unless something is done by business to be more proactive in in thinking about social contract, in thinking about what can be done to to to, to move into the clearly the, the the low carbon transition in a in a faster way uh, on the environmental side, to look at how socially it can be more responsible, and I think the the way clearly vitality plugs into that is. Uh, and shared value plugs into that, as, uh, as Stuart has said. It, it, the benefit is, is a win-win-win. It's, it's a win for the individual members, for the individual uh, clients who are benefiting themselves. It's a win for the, for the company in terms of, uh, of mortality rates, uh, persistency, all sorts of technical factors that, again, are uh, highly positive for profitability. And it's a, it's a win, as clearly this study demonstrates for society. Yeah, you know, I think the uh, you know what's really just great about Vitality is that we've all, as companies, faced pressure externally around res uh, you know corporate responsibility, and you know we have large timber holdings in our general account and responsible forestry management, environmental issues, and so forth. What's awesome about Vitality is it's uh, it's being socially responsible with respect to our core offerings. Yeah. it's not just sort of how we operate as a company; mm -hmm. it's how we actually deliver services and value mm -hmm. to our customers and. 
it's kind of sad in a way. Our customers actually didn't expect that from us. No, mm -hmm. no customer ever said to us, hey, how come you're not helping me? You stand to gain a lot if I live a long time. How come you're not helping me? Yeah. But yet, as soon as we articulate that logic, that bit of logic has been the most powerful sales tool we've ever had. Yeah. Not the discounts, not the Apple, as wonderful as the Apple Watch. But it's, hey, we're going to try to help you. So um, it's a wonderful form of social responsibility, I think, in the core conveyance of our services. So let me touch on an employee angle. A, a quick story springs to mind um, about Janice. Janice uh, joined my team about a month ago in our product development area. <laughs> and, and the guy said to me, Stu, we want you to, to meet Janice. Welcome Janice aboard. And so I, I sat down with Janice. I said, Janice, welcome to AIA. It's, it's great to have you on the team. So, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, where, where have you come from? And she had come from a, a, French, a French competitor. And I said, well, it's great that you're now part of the, the AI family. I said, but you know, you, you do product development work. You could have done it anywhere. You could have stayed where you were. Just, I'm just curious, why, why AIA? And she said, oh, your purpose. And I said, okay. And she said, healthier, longer, better lives, vitality. I love what you stand for. I want to be part of that. I want to contribute to that. And I've got to tell you, I, I had goose pimples. I, I was very, very choked up. But what it, it, it led me to understand is where there's smoke, there's fire. And there's a lots of Genesis um, out there. So there's this real underlying movement, this expectation, this, this need um, that our employer, I want to work for somebody who stands for something that I believe in, or else I'm, I'm just going to go elsewhere. Don't underestimate it. Fiona. I promise we've got 80 seconds mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. you, you said you had interesting success stories, examples. Can you give us just one that you've seen that, that really works? Oh, one. Um, well, uh, we, we can see that using the mobile di digital technologies is definitely a, a, a successful way to reach people. And I think that the um, uh, evidence which has been shown last year's report and elsewhere, that we can help people by nudging them, by rewarding them, by reminding them. The technology can now help us get off the seat um, to do some activity and remind us and reward us by just giving feedback um, to something which has been a little bit difficult to quantify. I think everyone thinks they're active, but when they see that pedometer or whatever. So those sorts of things. Number two, if I may, the advice from the doctor yeah. is an effective uh, moment of intervention. And it can be brief, but by assessing, asking, recalling, and then following up, we know that that can be the trigger to change. So combine the two, and you're starting to get somewhere. Thirdly, look at your cities. Walking, <laughs> cycling, closing streets, opening up pedestrianisation and creating more parks and using those parks. Sometimes business getting involved in providing opportunities uh, outside their walls, outside the gyms, in the community. So um, three examples of which need to be put together to get that ecosystem change. Uh, and they're not happening just in Europe or in the sort of U the UK. I think I did also mention... Uh, um, consider mentioning the, uh, the This Girl Can campaign. That's a mindset change. For those of you in the UK, the This Girl Can campaign put out by um, Sport England is showing women who are less active, often older and often from disadvantaged groups, and each market will have their equivalent population group. If you target the message to how it, they feel about being active, how they value it and often want to be, you can shift behaviour. The data show more women are participating in the UK because of that incentive message that's not the stereotype. It's not young, it's not already slim, and not already um, fit and active. It's actually resonating because they're doing basically good marketing. So we can draw, and that's why it's a pleasure to be here, because <coughs> business working with government, working with communities, is going to be the solution. Um, we can't do it from the World Health Organization. We're very good at data. We're very good at norms and standards and guidance and independence on this issue, but we actually need to work with many others, and uh, solutions lie in this room. Fiona, Mark, Stuart, Brooks, it's been a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot. Please join me in thanking our panellists. Tim and your panel, thank you for a really fascinating discussion. Um, Tim, I'm particularly intrigued by our, your idea of storing up activity credits. And I do wonder whether or not we could see a secondary market 
evolving here in trading these credits as well. I'm saying this as someone who witnessed her mother once bribing a grandchild to wear her Fitbit so she could get to her prescribed number of steps yeah. per day. Uh, I'm not sure whether the idea should take off in the interest of global health and well-being, but uh, I'll just stick it out there. Um, it's been a really fascinating morning so far, as well as being taken through the ideas behind the study and the findings. Uh, we've heard some reflections as well so far. Um, you know, behavioral economic, nudge theory, uh, positivity, as I like to think of it. It's become a bit of a trendy idea, really, but what we've seen here in action today is how simple application of those various ideas can result in massive changes to the benefit of society as a whole. Um, the shared value model is something that in, is being practiced already by this particular industry, uh, but they're very much ahead of the curve and it's intriguing to know whether that will have applications elsewhere as well. And it's been really fascinating to hear about the payback from that, uh, but also some of the challenges there could be. Uh, we've had ideas about how to get more of this into action. Um, Better programs, as Professor Bull was uh, outlining there, and as she was highlighting as well, it's, um, it's not a case of one size fits all, so it'll require some thinking, some innovation and some fresh approaches. We've heard a lot about the benefits to those of working age in this room, but Adrian highlighted something uh, a bit earlier which I found particularly thought-provoking, which is about adolescence. And we know that they're a particular issue right now. Uh, they're not getting enough exercise. Those ideas get ingrained early and it becomes a lifestyle habit. But how do we get them in particular into better habits? I think walking to the Apple store and back might get them the steps, but what they might pick up while they're there might just actually make the problem worse in some cases rather than better. So we need to think about how we actually uh, kickstart a revolution. And one of the points that's been highlighted on the stage it's not just about incentivizing us. It's, uh, you know, and yeah, the idea of a free cup of coffee is fantastic, particularly uh, to me who sometimes has to get up at three o'clock in the morning. But it goes beyond that. As we were hearing, uh, gaming as well, we need to appeal to our competitive nature. So, we've got all that in mind. We're now going to hear about one incredibly exciting venture which is going to take place around the globe. I've been told I can't give away any details at all. So I'm going to invite Adrian Gore back up to the stage alongside Lord Sebastian Coe and Nick, Nick Beresford sorry, to actually tell us all about it. Thank you. So I'll be very brief. Uh, you know, we, we are continuously finding ways to incentivize change and to find any mechanism that we think we can scale and globalize to really achieve the goals that we set out to do. So a lot of work has taken place. I'm not going to take time. I'd like to ask Lord Coe maybe to just frame this for us and, uh, and I, I think it will work. <laughs> I hope. Good. Well, thank you, Adrian, for that vote of confidence. Um, I'm sure it will work. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here uh, as a uh, Vitality Ambassador and somebody that's been a non-exec director uh, since 2013. I think this is a really exciting moment uh, in the genesis of this business. I was uh, reflecting for a few moments uh, not quite in the same league as the minister who chased up to Birmingham to, to pound the pavements for a general election campaign. He did five, or said he was on his fifth general election. I did, it did three. Uh, and on the eve of my first one, uh, I was asked, uh, given that only a year or so earlier I'd been in international athletics, I was asked what the similarities between uh, politics and, and sport and I said look there are some very clear similarities in both activities uh, you get injuries but rarely in, pol in sport are they inflicted by your own teammates that didn't start my political career particularly well uh, and Adrian I was also reflecting on uh, your uh, how would you quantify two and a half years uh, in somebody's life and I was reminded of the late great Geoffrey Bernard of this parish uh, who through the pages of the uh, Spectator magazine managed to chronicle the extraordinary and Herculean quantities of alcohol that he consumed uh, in the course of a year. 
uh, and placed a, an advert in the Times newspaper simply saying that I'm currently working on an autobiography, and if anybody knows where I was between 1979 and 1987, <laughs> uh, I'd be very grateful. It's, it's not quite two and a half years, but uh, well, two and a half years, but seven in his case. Uh, let me pull the knitting together very quickly because I think this is a, a, a wonderful moment. Um, I am incredibly lucky. From the age of 11, I guess I can probably say, and I'm now in my early 60s, I have been involved one way or another waking up most mornings at knowing that physical activity through sport uh, was going to fashion uh, uh, and, and shape uh, my, my life. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to say that that is, is still the case, and I'm, I know I, I'm incredibly lucky. And I suppose I, I was talking to my kids actually not long ago about you know, what physical activity meant for them and what it's meant for them through me. And they said, look, Dad, it's really simple. I know that if you don't train for two days or be physically active for two days, you notice it. Uh, if you don't uh, maintain a physical activity program for three days, we notice it. <laughs> and I sort of reflected on that. And actually, the continuity uh, of what we've talked about this morning, and Adrian, you've set the scene perfectly, and the panellists have, have gone into the background and the research. I'm, I'm certainly not going to add anything to that. But I guess what I'm so pleased about, having been a part of the Vitality family now for the best part of six years, and you know, disruption is, a, is an overly used word, and I'm not sure anybody really properly understands it. I prefer to use the word pioneer. And I think what Vitality has done is that it has pioneered not only this work, but it has crucially set the scene around thought leadership. Uh, it has been at the forefront in thought leadership, and not just dry academic analysis, but the ability to really apply that to the business model and create a difference uh, in the lives of, of so many people. Uh, and we know the pledge, and it's your pledge, in fairness. We rehearsed this for, for many years, the pledge of 100 million people being 25% more active um, over the next few years in the lead up to 2025 is absolutely crucial and there's not a shred of evidence that doesn't point uh, in that direction. We know that the top 10 pathologies are not uniquely linked to physical inactivity but my goodness they are closely linked and during my time as chair of the government's legacy team immediately after 2012, the next phase of that journey was about physical inactivity and the ticking time bomb that was described uh, on this platform. It is going to be the drag anchor on all our global economies and that is something that I'm really pleased that this company is addressing. Um, I'm not also allowed to talk about the initiative, so you're not the only one. Uh, but I am able to hand over to Nick, uh, who will take you through the next phase of the glorious history of this company and the unique nature of the way that it has approached the lifelong challenge around physical inactivity and particularly uh, the engagement uh, of young people along that journey. So I think I'm now going to hand over to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, from Chris calling on them. So that's the Chris calling on them. America is calling on them. And I hope nobody's calling on him. The more people from your country that run, the more chance it has of winning. So, can your country call on you? Join in for free today. Well, that's sort of a little bit, uh, yeah, ruined the announcement in a way, but uh, no, it's, um, look, uh, you know, when I was um, growing up, I, I dreamed of uh, representing my country in a major sporting event. You know, I don't know whether anybody else here, you know, had that dream as well. Um, but the Vitality Running World Cup is really the event where everybody in the world, no matter what their ability, can realize that dream. Um, we're so thrilled to be partnering with Vitality and the, the wider partners um, because this is an event that 
is truly about changing the world. It's about getting people, we've talked about the pledge of getting 100 million people more active, or well, this is a way that we're hoping to be able to help deliver on that and in turn create the biggest mass sporting event ever in history. So what is it and how do you get involved? Well, it's very simple. You go to the runningworldcup.com. You can sign up. It's a free event. Um, you can use any number of tracking devices, whether it's a phone or a watch. Um, there's over 2 billion people that actually have these tracking devices. Um, and so this really is about sort of democratizing these big global sporting events for the masses. It's not just about the elite. This is for everybody. Everybody's got that chance. So what do you actually have to do? It's fairly simple. You just have to complete a 3K run in under 30 minutes. And um, you, 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 it's registered on your tracker. And one of the nice little bonuses, if you do that, you also get a $100 running uh, goodie bag. Um, the, um, so, you know, I guess it's that moment where, you know, you're sat in front of the, the TV and you're maybe watching the Olympics or watching the World Cup and, you know, you want to be on the pitch, you want to be on the track. Well, again, you know, this is that opportunity. This is that opportunity for everybody to compete for their country. So, um, I wanted to sort of basically announce that the the 2020 Vitality Running World Cup is officially now, registration is now open. The event is in March 2020. And I wanted to thank everybody here really in advance for helping to get that message out to the four corners of the world um, and help everybody give them that opportunity to realize their dream. Um, we all, one of the exciting things is we have some great country captains. You saw Usain there for um, Jamaica, but um, uh, we also have a great country captain, no one better really to lead the UK than uh, multi-world and Olympic champion, Dame Jessica Hill Ennis, and we'll hear from her now. Hi everybody, it's Jessica Ennis Hill here. I'm really excited to tell you that I've signed up to be the UK captain for the Vitality Running World Cup. In March, I want you to join me and lots of other UK runners to represent your country to see if we can win the 2020 Vitality Running World Cup. To take part, simply visit runningworldcup.com to sign up today. Nick, Adrian and Lord Coe, thank you so very much. Uh, Nick, I think we're all slightly disappointed you weren't wearing that T-shirt for the big reveal. Uh, but uh, you hear that, you saw, you saw the weight of support uh, behind this initiative. Uh, it proves to be very exciting indeed. And uh, uh, you know, as we've been hearing this morning, this is just the start. This is just sowing the seeds of change around the globe. Who knows if we were back here in 2050, let's hope that we actually get to that point. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for going against the grain of what's being talked about this morning and, and sitting still for the past hour or so uh, to listen to what we've heard unveiled here on the stage. But I'm sure we can all agree that it's been wholly worthwhile. Um, this is all about behavioral change. Those seeds take time to get sown and emerge, but boy, oh boy, the gains that could be got from it. So it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to all our speakers over the course of this morning for sharing their ideas and taking us through this journey. And now really, it's over to all of you. And I think uh, it's now the challenge for all of us to get out here and what might be quite uh, an easy idea, think of going and sitting at your desk. I hope this has inspired you to do anything but that. Thank you.
We're committed to getting 100 million people around the world 20% more active by 2025. Welcome to a Vitality world that rewards you for making healthier choices every day. Because when we're all 20% more active, we live better, longer, and stronger. And when we make 100 million people healthier, we make families, communities, businesses, countries, society, and ultimately the world healthier. So deep. 